In my personal experience reading film criticism, I've found that I'll often see the term emotional manipulation, as in a critic will call a film emotionally manipulative, and I'll read this and I'll think, yeah, sure, that makes sense, and I'll just keep reading. But one day I stopped when I saw this word, and I thought to myself, wait a minute, no shit. Every piece of art is emotionally manipulating you. The way I see it, there are two purposes to art to make you think and to make you feel, and often these purposes are connected so that one fosters the other. The latter purpose is, in and of itself, emotional manipulation. Music is actually probably the best demonstration of this. Chords are just combinations of mathematical intervals of sound frequencies that have been decided evoke certain emotions, and the more intervals are added, the more complex these emotions are. Cadences are just emotional shortcuts. Scale degrees have been given names and hierarchical positions based on the emotion they evoke. A leading tone will be unsettling, instilling in us a desire to return to the tonic, which will then instill a feeling of closure or satisfaction, but ending a phrase on the dominant or the mediant can completely change this progression of emotions. While less concretely rooted in theory, film does the exact same thing. Say a couple breaks up in a movie and gets back together in the end. This is essentially the equivalent of an authentic cadence. The breakup, or the dominant or leading tone, causes tension that is then resolved by getting back together, or returning to the tonic. Same principle. This is emotional manipulation. Every movie you watch is emotionally manipulating you. Hey Mitch. Yep. What's the greatest movie ever made? The Godfather. The Godfather shows us how brutal and seemingly heartless Vito can be, which makes his devotion to his family that much more effective. When you juxtapose this with Michael's ruthlessness, even for his own family members, not letting family get in the way of business, and after seeing how Michael's morals have changed from the beginning of the film, this emotionally manipulates us to feel sad about his moral degradation, and afraid knowing he doesn't lack the one weakness Vito had. Hey Mitch. Yup. What's the second greatest movie ever made? Fight Club. Fight Club uses weakness to make us pity its characters. Tyler as a miserable insomniac, Marla as someone who was sexually abused, Bob as a cancer patient, even Angel Face as someone who was once beautiful and is now mutilated. All of these people put their faith in this idea of Tyler Durden, who ends up being even more destructive than everything else in their lives, and it makes us feel like shit. Hey Mitch. Yup. What's the third greatest movie ever made? The Dark Knight. The Dark Knight uses the relationship that had been set up in Batman Begins and has only become more complicated by making Batman choose between this relationship and the future of Gotham that lies in Harvey Dent. Letting Rachel die is emotionally manipulative enough, but that carries over to Harvey Dent's betrayal, which takes the sadness from Rachel's death and exponentially increases it, adding in levels of anger as well. Hey Mitch. Uh-huh. What's the fourth greatest movie ever made? Pulp Fiction. Okay, we don't need to keep doing this. These surface-level analyses of every frat bro's favorite film demonstrate just how rudimentary emotional manipulation is as a concept in every film. And therein lies the confusion of reviewers using this term as a criticism. When they say manipulation, they don't actually mean manipulation. They mean bad manipulation, cheap manipulation, sloppy, lazy, uninspired manipulation, or really, not manipulation at all. Gabriella Urbina of Mixdown posits that a truly successfully emotionally manipulative film is not considered manipulative by critics, but rather praised for being, as she puts it, an emotional tour de force. She claims that it's when a film makes its audience conscious of the fact that they're being manipulated that it's then deemed manipulative. And from this line of reasoning, we can reach the conclusion that when a film is called manipulative, it actually means the opposite, that it was, in fact, not manipulative, despite trying to be. This failure to manipulate can come from any number of reasons. The story is riddled with cliches. The film makes these manipulative attempts obvious via cinematography or music. The performances might be hammed up. There's a whole library of images that essentially scream at you to feel a certain way. A dog dying. A climactic embrace. A debilitated person doing something we didn't think he was capable of. Ending a movie with a memorial service for a character that died, and even showing clips from earlier in the movie like a certain movie that's in theaters right now. But I won't name names. These are all, again, so obvious that they're in turn not manipulative, but attempting to be manipulative. Another indicator that makes these emotional ulterior motives obvious is the lack of a purpose for any of these sounds or images that are supposed to manipulate us. A truly manipulative film, and here I mean manipulative in a good way, would mask its tools of manipulation under some sort of disguise, be it 
a means of organically progressing the story or otherwise. When it has no disguise, and we can clearly see that these images and sounds and, and overall scenes exist solely to make us feel a certain way, then that manipulation attempt once again becomes obvious and thus unsuccessful. And then the film is deemed manipulative even though it failed in its manipulation. This brings me to a film that recently came out called Beautiful Boy. The narrative itself is compelling, as we see Timothy Chalamet's character Nick descend into addiction and repeat a terrible cycle as his father David tries to fix the situation. However, throughout the film we get these constant flashbacks to Nick's childhood as he and David do all these bonding activities, surfing and whatnot. In these scenes we learn why they have a certain catchphrase that's integral to their relationship, and we get some context, but nothing really important to the story is explained in these flashbacks that isn't either explained or implied in the present day scenes. It can be said, then, that these scenes serve no purpose other than to ham up the emotion, which, in turn, causes the film to be less successfully emotional. However, the film is more than just a narrative about Nick's addiction and David's attempts to help. Because it's based in part on the real-life David Sheff's memoir, a large portion of the film is also about David simply reflecting on his experiences with Nick, living in his head, which isn't really about the narrative at all, just an internal reflection. This kind of transcends the idea of storytelling. If the film is just as much about David's reflection as it is about the narrative at play, then these flashbacks can't necessarily be discounted, as they are an integral part of that reflection. And I won't lie, this is something I don't have the answers to. All I know is that I'm the kind of person who needs to explicitly understand why I feel a certain way about certain things in order to know whether or not I actually feel that way. And with Beautiful Boy, it's a little hard to tell. I keep viewing these flashbacks through the context of the film as a narrative, as a story, and as soon as I deem them unnecessary, I view them through the context of David, lost in his own memories, and I just can't figure it out. So what do I do? I make a video about it. And then the end of that video becomes incredibly meta and self-referential, leaving me in a position of uncertainty regarding how to end it. I haven't reached any new conclusion, but at least these thoughts are out there now. Hopefully you got something from this, um, I'm gonna go now, so have a nice day, thanks for watching, and, uh, you know, I'm always accepting more patrons, so. I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna end this now. Cool. Hey Mitch. Yup. What's the fourth greatest movie you ever made? <laughs> I really don't know. Pulp fiction. <laughs>